tune in as they come. Okay, awesome. Thank you. You're so welcome, welcome everybody to our second Florida Young Birders J Chat. Um, we're super excited to have you. Um, just make sure that you're muted for the talk that we have coming up. Um, it's just some reminders to mute and then stop your video to view your uh, to view the presentation a little bit better. Um, so happy to announce Adam Kent is with us today. Um, Adam is a biologist and tour guide. He has volunteered for tons of different projects, given many different presentations. He served um, twice as the president of the Florida Ornithological Society, which is actually um, what this group, the Florida Young Birders Club is kind of part of. Um, so on the steering committee of the second Florida Breeding Bird Atlas, worked for 12 years with the Florida Fish and Wildlife um, Conservation Commission. It's in so many different great things. Um, he's actually the first, the state's first Florida scrub jay conservation coordinator, um, which is really cool because that's our logo bird. Um, he's visited more than 50 countries and he actually, recordings that he made have helped lead to the discovery of a new species of bird, which is crazy. So. Um, Adam, thank you so much. If you want to start sharing your presentation with us, um, can't wait to see your see what you have to share with us today. All righty, let's see if this works. Can you see it there? Oops. Not, not yet. It's not working, huh? No, it's it's working. Just give it a it's moment. Working. Okay. It's just it's just takes it a moment to cycle. Okay. Or maybe not. Yeah, it's good. There we go. And do, can you, it is good. Okay. Can you see my cursor on the screen? Yes. Can you see, can you see my, you can. Okay. Okay. So, so you're looking at the presentation, not the, um, slide with my notes on it then I guess which is perfect all right well thank you all for inviting me to talk here and I'm really excited to be here I'm excited about this club and uh, today I just want to talk about uh, careers that are that work with wild birds and I put the word wild in there because there are other careers where you could work with birds you could work with pet birds or a vet or all kinds of different things or you know habitat modeling or genetics or something like that but but this is specifically outdoors working with wild birds. And so, okay, let's see here. There we go. Here's a, a brief outline of the talk. Uh, and this is from my perspective, obviously, what does a bird biologist slash ornithologist slash bird guy do? And uh, then how did I end up here? Things I like most about doing these things I do anything that I don't like about it, and then any recommendations for folks who want to do some similar jobs. So <clears throat> that's me. And uh, right now, my main uh, job is working as a biologist for a consulting company, and mainly I'm doing bird surveys. So that's what I'm doing in that photo. I'm out in a field doing uh, a bird survey in early in the morning. And I'll first talk a little bit about how that works because that's a, a big part of my job right now. And that's something you all might be interested in. Okay, so these surveys, you know, they're bird surveys, so they start early. Some of them start a good bit before dawn. And sometimes you have to walk out to your survey point. So you may be uh, walking even in the dark, you may have to walk a half mile or something to the point where you stay for your survey. It could be dark when you start, and but then the sun comes up and you've got these beautiful sunrises and you hear birds like the eastern meadowlark singing all around you. And uh, sometimes you can actually drive to your survey point and then it's nice. You can stand up in the bed of your truck and you've got a higher perspective on the landscape. But uh, a lot of the surveys that we do, especially between January and um, and uh, April are uh, for crested caracaras. And those surveys are uh, start 15 minutes at least or more before dawn. You go for a few hours and um, 
Yeah. And so the crested caracara is a federal, federally listed species in Florida. Um, it's on the federal endangered species list. And so if somebody wants to do some sort of a development in Florida, they have to first survey to see if crest, crested caracaras are using those areas and especially if they're nesting near there. And so that's what we're trying to figure out when we do these surveys. And um, you know, sometimes you get a nice close up view, but uh, often the birds are, are really far away like that you know, I'm just little specks in the top of a tree. So it, you, not only do you need to be able to identify birds if you can see them well, but you need to be able to identify birds at a, at a distance of a mile or more away um, to be qualified to do these, these surveys. And um, in addition to caracaras, we also will work with other species that are state or federally listed species, so threatened or endangered species at the federal or state level. So uh, the bur burrowing owl, the Florida subspecies of burrowing owl, is a state threatened species, so we might do surveys for those. Uh, there's also the southeastern kestrel, and um, we do, uh, that's a, a lot of projects, especially May, June, uh, July, our kestrel survey time. If you're surveying earlier or much later in the year, then you might be also seeing migrant cows. Um, in late spring and early summer, we're especially targeting uh, surveys for these uh, local breeding kestrels. And then, of course, there are also surveys for your whoop, for your mascot. Oh shoot, I spoiled that. Uh, it's not the tortoise. It's the uh, the Florida scrub jay, Florida's only endemic species of bird. And um, those surveys can take place at various times of year. Um, and each survey has a little bit of different protocol. Um, this is just a sample of some of the species that we survey for. There's Florida grasshopper sparrow and various other things, you know, eagles and things like that. <laughs> so various different types of, of breeding bird surveys, uh, usually in the spring from January through through midsummer, uh, but sometimes, especially even scrub jay surveys or some other types of surveys, could happen in the in the fall. And then, uh, when we're not looking for birds, we'll do we'll look for other things sometimes, like uh, gopher tortoise. That's another um, a big part. A lot of uh, environmental consultants in Florida look for gopher tortoises, and they're not actually looking for the tortoises usually. What they're looking for is the tortoise burrows that look like that. Uh, so you'll go hike back and forth around uh, a site and count all the burrows and indicate if they're adults or uh, sub-adults or, 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 you know, based on the size of the burrow, and if they look active or not active. Um, and so that's another um, part of the job. So, so even when you're uh, working specifically with birds, and that's the main part of your work, a lot of biologist positions, not all of them, but a lot of different positions, you'll end up doing some other things too. So, so if you're doing bird stuff, you may also end up working with tortoises. And in addition to the, the survey type of work, you may end up coming into situations like this, where you've got a tortoise burrow and there's some silt fence around it. That's that black, um, this stuff is called silt fence. And sometimes at a construction site, there's somebody's driven over it or the tree fell on it or something. So you've got to, um, you know, fix the silt fence so the tortoises don't go into a construction area or something like that. So, so in addition to bird surveys, you know, you, if you're working as a, as a consultant, at least, you should be prepared to do a variety of other things that, uh, at least in Florida, it will include um, probably gopher tortoise surveys. And um, so then in addition to the Florida-based work, there is other stuff that I've got to do, which is fun, and that's outside of the state. For example, this June, I got to go to Northern Canada and uh, get helicoptered up in some really remote areas for bird surveys. So those are my knees and boots looking out the front of a helicopter as I was going into uh, Ontario, way up in the uh, boreal forest. It's actually one of the largest wetlands in the world, the uh, Hudson Bay lowlands. And uh, we'd tromp around all day, doing, walking to a survey point and then doing surveys there. And then sometimes we would see these, uh, you know, beautiful sunrises or something like that when we got to the point. So 
Um, that's a little bit of, of the consulting work that I do. Uh, in addition to consulting, probably at least this year, what I do maybe with the second most amount of, uh, of time of what I do is volunteer work, which I'm by nature, volunteer means I'm not getting paid, but I have spent a lot of time working with the Florida Ornithological Society in the past dozen or 15 years. And, and especially this past year, because we're finishing up the Breeding Bird Atlas, which is basically a survey for birds that breed across the state. The field work finished in 2016, and we're finishing up the analysis and those species write-ups and things like that. So that should be coming out, should be going public by early next year. Um, and uh, I highly recommend getting involved in, uh, you know, you, you don't, you could come at any age. We've had people in high school at the Florida Ornithological Society meetings. We do great field trips and then all kinds of interesting scientific papers. And um, in addition to the uh, professional papers, we almost always have a student paper session. So you'll not only get to see what professional ornithologists around the state are working on, but uh, you'll see what students of ornithology on the state and sometimes even from out of state are working on with the presentations. Um, and it's a, it's a really great welcoming environment. So I definitely encourage anyone to uh, come to a Florida Ornithological Society meeting if you get a chance. The bigger meetings are in the fall. Spring meetings are usually more small, just dealing with sort of the business side of things. But the spring meetings have uh, uh, lots of interesting presentations. Um, in addition to Florida Ornithological Society, local bird, uh, uh, usually there in Florida, there are Audubon societies, are great ways to meet people, uh, learn from really knowledgeable people. Sometimes they have programs where you can go out and volunteer for a project, for example, the Alachua Audubon Society does all kinds of cool programs. One of them is you know, kestrel nest boxes. So you can go out and volunteer with the people who are doing that project to learn about kestrels and nesting kestrels and help put up their nest boxes. And each Audubon chapter around the state does things a little bit differently, but they all have nice bird walks at least. And a lot of them have programs at night that are interesting. And then a lot of them have various different programs that you may be able to volunteer with. So that's another fun thing you can do to get involved. And you know, you're not getting paid for doing this stuff, but it's a great way to meet people that may have connections for jobs and, and just learn and go out and have fun. And uh, so one of the things that I've done a lot with the uh, Audubon chapters, especially with the Florida, uh, with, with uh, Alachua Audubon Society that I've been a member of for most of my life is lead field trips. And the field trips are great. You can, you know, once you get started and you get some expertise, you can help lead the trips because there's always a need for people to help point out birds. But even if you're not leading, just going on these trips is, is really fun. You get to go to some of the coolest places in the state or even out of state. This is a group uh, where we went to Tall Timbers Research Station, which is north of Tallahassee. And then from there, uh, we got to listen to Jim Cox, uh, who's an expert in uh, um, birds and uh, it works in especially pine forest bird, brown-headed nuthatch, red cockaded woodpecker, things like that. So he gave all kinds of interesting presentations in the field. And then where we are in this photo is called uh, Greenwood, and that's in Georgia. It's one of the best uh, preserved remaining tracks of longleaf pine in the world. and. Uh, if this looks strange to you, it looks a little unnatural because it looks like it's way too open for a pine forest. This is actually how a lot of the state looked. A lot of the longleaf pine areas across the Southeast would have looked like this and, and they would have burned every couple of years. And these are humongous uh, longleaf pine trees and the, the area would have been wide open. Um, so if you ever get a chance to go up north of Tallahassee, this is actually near Thomasville, Georgia, about an hour north of Tallahassee. If you ever get a chance to go on a field trip that goes up that area, I highly recommend it because it's just, it's so beautiful. And the most common birds up there, some of the most common birds are red pocket woodpeckers. Uh, so what about seeing other kinds of wildlife? What, what if you want to do a career as a wildlife guide? Well, so that's another thing that I do for work is I lead tours uh, all over the world. Uh, this 
company is called Eagle Eye Tours. That's the one that I'm mostly working with now. Uh, this is a tour that I've led in Central California. Um, and uh, let's see here. So that's my my bio page on the on the website for Eagle Eye Tours. And um, uh, working for a uh, international tour company is a great way to to go see places all around the world. You might start out as a co-leader or something like that and then get enough experience so you're leading these trips on your own. Um, I've done a lot of trips uh, mostly with, with this company in the U.S. but all over the place including to uh, this is a, been a bunch, done a bunch of these Texas tours. On the Texas tours uh, we'll see the whooping cranes at Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. And of course we go down into the uh, Rio Grande Valley where we see green jays. And um, then recently, I first time I led a tour to Hawaii where we saw these um, red-tailed tropic birds and all kinds of other really cool birds. Uh, and then of course for tour leading, in addition to knowing the birds, it's really about working with people. And so you have to be a people person also. You have to like working with people. Here we are out in uh, some grasslands in southeastern Arizona looking for sparrows. And, and um, a lot of this tour leading is um, pointing out birds and getting to work with, with all kinds of interesting people. Um, the guy here on the left side with the camera in the photo is Sky Haas. He's been a tour leader with me. And on a bunch of the tours, especially Arizona and Texas. And you can see the group, how much fun they're having there. They're just full of laughs. And the groups are usually really a bunch of really nice, fun people who, with a lot of great travel experience. And um, if you've been leading these tours for a while, every once in a while, you, you might get the chance to sort of design your own tour, especially depending on who you know as a local guide. So uh, we ended up doing this a few years ago uh, right before COVID, actually, we <coughs> designed this tour that went to um, Southern Africa uh, from Victoria Falls through the Okavango to Namibia. And that was uh, with my wife, Gina, who will be speaking to you at some point down the line. And then al also with a friend of ours who is a South African guy who was the main guide. And in this case, um, we'd been to South Africa before, but we were more like tour leaders, even though we pointed out the birds and things like that. But we had the local South African guide as an expert. And that was really fun. We saw all kinds of crazy birds like this Pell's fishing owl. And uh, you guys recognize this one by any chance? It's a crazy raptor, a secretary bird. And uh, then you'll find, uh, in addition to some of these uh, large charismatic speaker uh, spe spe species, uh, sometimes there are these localized birds that are really cool, um, like this little rock runner, which is very localized uh, bird, almost endemic to Namibia. And, and um, let's see here, then of course, in Africa, you've got a bunch of hornbills. This is the African gray hornbill. These birds were at the lodges. Uh, a lot of the places, especially in other countries, when you're going on tours, there are some really nice lodges that you'll stay at. And um, so, so yeah, leading tours gets you to some really cool places. Uh, this is a bird, this is a sociable weaver. This is a bird that I've wanted to see since I've been a little kid. They make these humongous nests and um, they're only in this sort of Namibia in northwestern South Africa area and um, western southern Africa. And so we got great looks at these guys. And so I wouldn't have seen these if I wasn't leading this tour. I mean, sooner or later, I probably would have gone to see them, but we got to see, the, I see these birds as a leading part of a tour. Uh, and uh, then even some really rare range restricted birds you'll see on trips. This is called a dune lark, and this is an endemic bird to Namibia. It only lives in these areas uh, near the Namibian coast with these huge sand dunes. And uh, so we were in these like 100 foot tall sand dunes or something like that, just humongous sand dunes hiking around looking for this, this kind of lark, which just blends in perfectly with the sand, as you can see. So. 
that was a, a really cool experience. And then uh, sometimes the birds are a little bit harder to see, like these um, couple kinds of sparrow larks here. And there's also a blacksmith plover in this photo. Um, of course, this is kind of a joke because they're obviously a bunch of large mammo, mammals in the picture. Um, springbok and giraffe and zebras. And um, so it's not always birds. And a lot of the tours, uh, usually it's general natural history. So, uh, you know, if you only know about birds, you'll, you'll have to learn about mammals and other things too. So, uh, yeah, especially a trip to Africa. Um, now, the interesting thing about birding tours is, um, whereas the average tourist that goes to Africa that's not on a birding tour might see a few of the more colorful and um, sort of charismatic birds. If you go on a birding, but the, but, but the average trip would focus on the mammals. But if you're on a birding trip, you'll see all kinds of other birds, but you also do see the mammals. So, um, you know, we, we went to this water hole in Namibia, saw all kinds of cool mammals there. And uh, also on this, this tour, we saw our first wild dogs in Africa, just right along the side of the road. So um, it's one of the things that I think all tour guides love about guiding. You never know what you're going to see. And wild dogs are really rare and they're hard to see in Southern Africa, but we just got really lucky in this group of wild dogs was right next to the road and we watched them for a long time. So you have all these amazing experiences that um, can happen when you're, when you're leading tours. And then, of course, it all goes back to people. And uh, this, uh, the guy in the far left there was our friend Errol. Uh, he's from South Africa. He, was, he drove and he was our uh, local guide there, just an awesome guy, really good, super knowledgeable guide. And then there's Gina uh, next to him. Uh, and then the other people are all people that we knew, super nice people from Gainesville, Florida, friends and friends of friends. And so we had a just an awesome group to, that uh, we traveled around with for for a few weeks there in, in southern Africa. That's the tour leading. Uh, next is uh, another thing that I've been doing uh, is volunteering and working with ARCI, the Avian Research and Conservation Institute. That's the a small nonprofit that my wife works for. And um, so I started out with them helping Gina do things like uh, put transmitters on short-tailed hawks and uh, swallow-tailed kites and things like that. And um, then also have been doing some bird surveys with them and uh, other various types of, of, of things. So um, that's four different things that I'm, that I'm doing right now that all, and any of them could be a full-time job except the the volunteer work wouldn't be, uh, you know, you wouldn't be making a living off of that. But uh, um, all things that are that are really interesting to um, uh, to learn more and, and sometimes have a career with with birds. But so, what do I like most about what do I what I do about all these different types of jobs working with with wild birds? Well, I love being outside and I love seeing all the cool stuff, as you probably could figure from seeing all the photos I just showed you. Uh, but I also like knowing that what I'm doing is contributing to bird conservation, whether it's helping put transmitters on birds like that short-tailed hawk that you just saw, or uh, whether it's uh, sort of maybe indirectly helping conservation by leading tours, which supports uh, local ecotourism, or whether it's the uh, biological consulting work where if you do, you know, you, you need to be qualify these surveys so you can identify the birds. You, they can't have unqualified people out there survey, surveying for birds. You need to actually care about what you're doing. You need to pay attention. You can't be looking at your phone the whole time or sitting down or listening to a podcast when you're when you're trying to be looking for birds. So you have to be focused and you have to care about what you're doing. And, and uh, you know, if you do a good job, then, then you submit a report to uh, that's not that the agencies that are the regulatory agencies, the FWC or the Fish and Wildlife Service or somebody else will see, and then they decide what can happen based on your observations at, at that site. So, what do I like least about what do I what I do? Well, you know, not really that much. But as this uh, this photo here maybe gives you a hint. Um, and this isn't a joke. I think the thing that I actually like least is skin cancer. 
and you probably can't see. I've got I've had skin cancer taken off my face here and here, and it's not something that should deter you from working outside. But hopefully, this will just convince you you should wear sunblock if you're doing a lot of work outside. Um, and the the other reason I put this in here is because, well, that's it's not a complaint. It's just sort of a consideration. There are things that uh, you hear people complain about who are working outside. For example, the heat, it's, we're in Florida and it's hot and you could be working in the summer. So if you don't like the heat, you shouldn't be doing field work in Florida in the summer. Or the briars, a lot of people hike around, and you're walking through thorny things. So if you're complaining about, you know, getting poked with a thorn, that's maybe not the thing for you. Or, or the bugs, you know, especially where there are birds, there are often a lot of bugs. And boy, that, that, for example, the job up in Canada, there are bugs all over the place and you just get used to it. And, and you definitely don't wanna be the one person on your field job who's complaining about the bug because it's not like everyone else didn't notice it. And it certainly doesn't help the mood. So, you know, if you're gonna be out in the field whining about, uh, oh, there's so many mosquitoes, oh, I can't stand it. Then, then maybe you, you wanna do something else with, with, with birds. Um, now, of course, there are other things that, that for almost any job that people might not like, like the bureaucracy, there's the paperwork, there's those kinds of things, but that comes with any job. And those are just the kinds of things you sort of get used to and you deal with. Um, but uh, really there's not much that I, that I don't like about it. And so I, I put this slide up here, not because I'm really angry about skin cancer every time I go in the field, but uh, to remind you to wear sunblock and also to point out that, uh, you know, if, if you don't like heat, or bugs or you know working hard outside then then you know a field biologist probably isn't what you want to be doing um, so how did i end up in doing these jobs doing these different various positions and you know what would what are some things you might want to do if you want to have a similar uh, position well uh before working as a consultant i worked uh, for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission for 12 years. First, I worked uh, part-time and I did a variety of different things during this part-time work. And so there are seasonal positions available all the time through, through FWC, the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, one of the first jobs I had was working with the uh, Great Florida Birding Trail, going out and scouting out these sites and you know, assessing the different sites. And that was a lot of fun. And um, then I also, uh, was the state's first scrub jay conservation coordinator, as was mentioned earlier. And um, I did that for a little while. And that was my first full-time job with, with FWC. And then I also worked for a, a grants program for them that, that had more to do with land management than birds, but also was always involved with different bird projects while I was doing that. Um, but uh, then after I left FWC, I worked for another consulting company before this consulting company and um, did some bird surveys, but also did more sort of desktop-based work, for example, uh, writing this uh, document, the BCR 31 plan, which is a bird conservation plan for Peninsular Florida. So I got a contract to do that, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, but let's go back all the way to the beginning here. So you know the game 20 questions. Uh, this is a different game, but it's uh, uh, also has 20 questions. And this is something that was popular a long time ago, but I've not seen this around for forever. And what you would do is you'd take a little notebook, you'd fold a page over, and you'd have 20 different questions. What's your favorite instrument, your favorite animal, who's your best friend, whatever. And then you'd answer those questions. And so I used to do that for fun when I was a little kid. And this is one uh, old note, notebook that I found in some box of my old things of my parents. So um, this is what I wanted to point out here though on that, uh, in that notebook. The what do you wanna be when you grow up? I had circled, I had written ornithologist, it's circled in red there. And the date there on the bottom of the page is 1974. So I was six years old when I knew that I wanted to be an ornithologist or when I thought I knew that I wanted to be an ornithologist. So what happened though is I was really into birds I've been into birds my whole life, but when I got into college, I took some biology classes. And at that point, back in the 80s, late 80s, uh, there was a little bit 
emphasis on some things like genetics and modeling and a little bit less emphasis on, on field ornithology. And I thought, oh, wow, I don't really even like this ornithology stuff. I want to just look at birds and study them outside. And there's a lot of other things I like to do. So it, I got, I had field jobs working with birds, temporary field jobs. But for a while there, I thought, well, maybe for, for a few years when I was call, in college, I wasn't sure if I really wanted to work with birds. But then finally, after trying a few things, I thought, no, this is definitely what I, what I really want to do. So then I came back to that and got a master's degree in ornithology. So uh, it's never to, uh, you, you can start as early as you want looking at birds. And that's one of the cool things I like about birding. This little two-year-old bird expert, he's only two and you can already use binoculars. I know you guys are older than this, but the cool thing about bird watching is you could do it at any age. Um, you know, two years, I've met people who are too young to speak, but can still identify birds. You can show them a bird in a book and they can point out the picture of that bird on the sign. It's really, it's a cool thing. And I think it's sort of ingrained in humans psyche. Uh, so I think that that uh, bird identification is just sort of a natural thing. You're never, you're not too young to, and you're never too old. You may decide at some point in college or some point in your life that you want to try something different, but you could always go back to to working with birds, or, or you may not want to work professionally with birds, but you may just want to work as a volunteer. And there are a lot of people that do that too, just volunteering for bird, bird projects. And that's a, another way to get involved with birds. What are some other ways, some ways to sort of increase your, um, your, your say marketability and your, your birding skills? Uh, that's what I want to talk about for a little bit now. So this is a drawing, just a little sketch I did while I was on the phone of a woodstork. Hopefully it's uh, recognizable. Um, and to these days, unfortunately, well, fortunately and unfortunately, the good news is there are tons of excellent cameras out there that are very affordable. And you can take their digital cameras. You can take as many pictures as you want for free. Then you can take them back. Look at, look at the photos on, on your computer. You can get all this experience looking at detail and all the feathers of, of the birds you take pictures of and you couldn't do that even 20 years ago because there was film cameras and um, it was very expensive to take pictures and and not that many people took that many pictures of birds but now photography has become so accessible that's a great thing the downside though unfortunately is that fewer people are drawing birds and as much as you might think, well, I'm not an artist, or this is just a pain, or you might not, you know, enjoy drawing. It's actually, it's, it's really fun, and it's a great way to learn about birds. There's no better way to learn shapes and patterns and uh, structure of birds than drawing. So I highly recommend it. Even if you're not an artist, uh, you can still draw a bird. For example, uh, you can draw a circle, you can draw some lines on it, and there you go. This is just a stylized a uh, bird head that I use in sparrow identification presentations, anybody can draw. So even if you think you can't, you can still do this, uh, as something very simplified like that. And this is really useful because where the field marks are. So, so you, you could look at, it doesn't have to be a field sketch. You could start out looking at pictures of birds in the field guide and just trying to copy them, just trying to get the pattern right and some of the details of the shape and proportions right. Um, and then uh, in any field guide and in the front of it, it's gonna have a section called bird topography. And in that section, uh, it'll have all these terms for different patterns and different parts of the bird. So um, for example, this is just a, a sort of stylized sparrow head and you've got all these names for, the, for these parts of a bird. In learning these, <coughs> the names for all this bird topography, it's really you know an area. It helps you see that area when you're in the field. If you didn't know the names of any of these parts of the sparrow head, when you got out in the field and you looked at the bird, then you try to describe it to someone, you might just say what well, had streaks on its on its head or something like that, or yellow somewhere on the face. But if you knew the terminology for all these things, you could say the super laurel or the or the front of its uh, eyebrow or supercilium was yellow. Then, then someone would know exactly what you're talking about and it helps you see those details better. Um, and the more you draw, the better you get. So, so if you start out drawing a circle with a triangle and some lines on it, 
pretty soon you could draw something like this, which is certainly not that that um, fancy, but it, it's it's a little bit more detailed. Um, so, what are some other things you can do to get experience? Well, I highly recommend going to birding festivals. Um, for example, this is the Florida Birding and Nature Festival, which is next weekend, and uh, going to these festivals is great for a few reasons. They're great field trips and speakers, and uh, they'll often have invited speakers coming from all over the United States. Uh, so listening to those talks and going on those trips is really useful. Um, but also, you can get to meet all these people in person there. So they're good contacts, people that might need help um, uh, in, you know, could get you a job somewhere or just give you some in useful contacts. So um, going to these festivals is, is, is a really good um, thing. And then, again, depending on how experienced you are, you could be leading uh, field trips for these festivals if you, if you know the birds pretty well. Um, so the final part of this presentation, I want to talk about three clues for bird identification. And then this isn't necessarily now what I do, and, and, and well, I actually do a lot of talks about bird identification, but I think that this, this is really important for getting a framework for identifying birds. So if you think about bird identification like this, and you think about these three different clues, um, this will sort of help you uh, sort of increase your expertise about birds. So there, in general, you can think about any, all bird identification it, it falling into these three categories or these three clues, distribution, behavior, and, and appearance. And distribution is uh, in space and time. So it's something like, uh, in space would be the range map. So you might know, well, shipping sparrows are only in the winter, although there may be a few birds in the panhandle, um, you know, but if you're farther north, you, you know, you can see from this map, the reddish color is the, uh, where they breathe, yellow is only migration, blue is only winter, et cetera. So learning your, your, your maps is really useful, your field, your range maps, but also learning about the habitat, that's part of the distribution. How are the birds distributed across the landscape within that range? Here's our little sparrow expert again, um, and he understands that grasshopper sparrows like these open grassy areas. So he's, he's got his, his ear on a grasshopper sparrow right, right there. Um, so that's, that's part of it. Uh, and then distribution also occurs in time, which is really important. Uh, to know the timing of when birds are around. For example, just a couple of days ago, we had in our yard here, we saw probably one of the last peewees of, of, the, of the fall migration in our yard, but we also saw the first uh, Eastern Phoebes in our yard. And there's a small overlap in that period of time. And this is just a sample eBird bar chart from, from Minnesota that shows that chipping sparrows are there in the summer and then the tree sparrows show up in the, in the winter. And um, so understanding how to use these bar charts is, is, is very good wherever you go. And you can look at it at the county level, at the hotspot level, at the state level. Um, you can also go into eBird and download this data and then mess around with it in Excel and see it, you know, visualize it in different ways. So, so highly recommend uh, eBird for uh, learning about bird distribution. They also have distribution maps, as, as you probably know there. Um, and then uh, behavior is the next clue for bird identification. And, and of course, that behavior can mean all kinds of different things, whether you see a bird by itself or whether you see a bird in a flock, how fast the bird flaps its wings when it flies, all those things. But uh, the one behavior I wanted to highlight in this presentation is sound because sound is super super important for birds for almost all kinds of birds and there have been all these studies a lot of the uh, bird surveys I do are uh, surveying uh, and you use sound to identify birds and for example and, and something I didn't mention earlier some of the the volunteer type work I'm, I do is breeding bird surveys there are adults with 50 stops where you stop for three minutes and count all the birds at each point and on those surveys, vast majority of the birds that we'll encounter are birds that we hear. Um, and, and this is just one study done in 1980, up to 80% of the birds in dense forests were heard, but not seen. I put a photo of a Tennessee warbler in there because they're loud birds that sing a lot in our, especially in the breeding grounds, you often don't see them because they blend in so well. Um, so getting to know your bird sounds well is really important. 
And there are, uh, there are some good books about that. There are Donald Kruzma has written a few really interesting books that talk about birdsong. Nathan Piplow has a field guide to bird songs, uh, bird sounds, I should say, where he describes the sounds well. And uh, those field guides are, are also really useful. And there's a website that's associated with it, of course, so you can hear those sounds. Uh, and then, of course, there's no substitute for field experience, especially going out with somebody who's more experienced. Um, so then the last clue for, for bird identification is appearance. And, and I put this as a last clue because uh, people often focus on appearance first, but often by, if you know the distribution of the birds and their habitats and the timing and, um, and their behaviors, you've got your choices of birds narrowed down to just a few birds before you're even thinking about what they look like. Um, so th those other two clues are also very useful and important to think about. But, but appearance, of course, also is uh, an important clue. And whoops. Uh, in appearance, a lot of people tend to focus on colors and patterns of birds, uh, especially colors, but uh, patterns are more important than colors, I'd say, because colors can vary with the lighting and they can change with distance, uh, but especially structure as far as the bird's appearance is one of the more important things. This is just a very rough tracing of a grasshopper sparrow. And you can see when you do a tracing like that, that the, the proportions become really obvious and that short tail is noticeable. Now, of course, you have to be careful for what's called foreshortening, which is if the bird's tail is facing you or facing away, it could look shorter. So you have to keep that in mind when you're watching a bird or looking at a photograph. But uh, most field guides, uh, most good field guides will show the birds in a nice profile so you can, so you can tell the proportions pretty well. Um, so, so you put it all together there, some of these appearance clues, and here's our, our uh, bird expert here, again, our two-year-old bird expert and, expert, and he's looking in the grass, and there's a short tail, they're streaking on the sides, a little bit of an orange tone, the different markings of the bird, Oops, whoops. and um, so uh, he, he put all those clues together and figured out that he was looking at a Lacan sparrow. All right, so the next, uh, the next thing that I think is a useful way to improve your bird identification skills is what I call increasing your radius of observation. And uh, you may have noticed this or not, but uh, it's pretty common for a lot of people to prefer to look at birds that are close to them. Kind of makes sense. The closer they are, the better view you have, the more details you can see. And that, that's just it's sort of a natural inclination. But if you want to increase your ability to identify birds and get better at, at picking them out from any uh, context, and especially if you're doing surveys for birds, you, you'll want to be able to identify birds at a long ways away. So um, in this little 50 meters to infinity thing here in the, the study by Matsuoka et al. in 2014, basically said that um, once you increase your radius uh, of observation for of birds, um, you're, you're uh, increasing your the number. If you're looking at birds only within about 50 yards, 50 meters of yourself, you what you see if you if you look at an unlimited radius or you look as far as you can see, you're seeing twice as many or three times as many birds um, if you increase that that radius. So sometimes you may wonder. How come some people go out and they always find a ton of birds and other people go out and they don't see that many birds? Well, part of it is that listening thing that I mentioned before, birding by ear. But another part of it is just looking at, at really distant birds. And, and um, one trick for doing that is you can see a bird that's close to you and as it fl that flies by. And as it flies by, just keep watching as, as it flies away in the distance and see how many details you can see as it's disappearing from view. Watch how fast it flies. Watch how it holds its head and neck. Um, watch how the colors disappear at a distance. Another thing that you um, could do, which is sort of the opposite of watching a bird fly away, is if you're driving down the road and looking at birds on a power line and seeing what happens, uh, you know, trying to guess what the bird is. Like, um, for example, you may see a bird on line and think, oh, that could be a morning dove, and you get closer. Oh, no, that was actually a mockingbird. Um, but you try to 
make a guess on what you're looking at. And then uh, here is one of my uh, favorite quotes from one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Yoda. This is the uh, greatest teacher failure is. So the, the key is to learn from your mistakes. And, and the you may have heard this uh, quote that the only difference between uh, uh, expert birder and uh, beginning birder is that the expert birder has made more mistakes. So don't be afraid to make mistakes, but also if you make a mistake, learn from it. Don't try to hide it. Don't ignore it. Don't pretend it didn't happen. Don't try to make some excuse, but instead think, oh, okay, yep, I misidentified that bird. I, well, I thought it was a morning dove and it was actually a, a mockingbird, but I, I think I just, you know, was birding by probability and I, I'd just seen a mockingbird in the wire and I thought there's probably another mockingbird and I hadn't actually seen enough detail to make that identification. So I, I know that if I'm this far away, I can't see the enough details to tell the difference between a mocking dove and a morning dove, or, or maybe, you know, you, you'll get you know, more practice and you will be able to tell the difference at that, uh, at that distance. Uh, but but uh, making mistakes, not feeling bad about the mistakes, but instead using these mistakes as a learning opportunity is, is really important. And it's, it's kind of strange. I, I like to point this out in, uh, that if you're learning to play an instrument or learning to play a sport, you know you're going to make mistakes. There's nobody who goes out and plays basketball and then quits if they miss when they try to shoot a basket and think, oh, that's no good. I'm not going to play anymore. But there are, you know, you hear people who are birding and they, they just feel horrible if they misidentify a bird. Well, it, it, it's going to happen. And the point is you just you learn from it. And if this uh, if this quote is a little bit too hard to remember or it doesn't sink in, I think this is such an important point that I like to also add another quote here, which is this. Failure is fertilizer, and it's the same sentiment in a little bit different way, which is if you mess up, instead of um, just making, getting frustrated and doing something else, use it to grow. Fertilizer, you think of, you put fertilizer on plants to help them grow. If you have a failure, if you try to do something and you don't get it right, just use that experience to, to grow yourself when you're um, in, in your, whatever you're trying to do, in this case, for bird identification, for example. And um, so I get out there. I want to close with saying, get out there and, and enjoy looking at birds, no matter what you decide to do, whether you're um, working for a, uh, as a biologist or doing it as a hobby or volunteering or doing one kind of bird survey or another. And especially don't be afraid to make mistakes. For example, you may have seen this bird here in the slide and thought, oh, that looks like a wimbrel. Well, that's actually a bristle-thighed curlew. Um, the photo was taken in Hawaii. So um, if you didn't know that it was a bristle-thighed curlew and not a wimbrel, you might think, well, I didn't know where it was taken, so I didn't know the distribution. So I can't make these assumptions if I know, unless I know where it was taken. And then if I look closer, you could even see the little bristles in the thighs and the patterns just slightly different. So uh, keep on learning, keep trying, keep pushing yourself so that you make mistakes. And then when you do, learn from those mistakes and make it into something productive. So with that, uh, I'll close and I'll take any questions you guys have. Thank you. Awesome, Adam, thank you so much. That was a really 